Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I uh, woke up yesterday in Tucson, Arizona, so we were just sharing stories about how nice it is. There's a picture of a, you know, a beautiful Christmas tree in the middle of, of the desert with some you know, jack dye around it and things like that. So it's good to be here today and back in the sort of season. Uh, I was speaking on something different that maybe I'll have a chance to allude to at the end. Uh, today I want to talk about a little bit of our small molecule collaborations and work that we've done and, and Rick and Edmund and others have really uh, talked quite a bit over the last few years about opportunities to interact with this department. So it's really a great, great pleasure to be here. Um, our laboratory has approximately you know, three, three small molecule projects. Some of them are repositioning and repurposing projects and some of them are uh, new small molecule discovery with uh, industry. And so um, today I'm going to talk about one of those, one of those projects around uh, an important pathway in human disease referred to as autophagy or autophagy, depending on your perspective or you know what side of the, the ocean you're on. But uh, here on this side, we refer to it as autophagy or, or the ability for a cell to consume or, or eat itself, if you will, in times of nutrient stress, chemotherapeutic stress, and other things as a means to uh, recycle uh, intracellular components for nutrients. So this is actually just a heat intensity map of an osteosarcoma cell line, uh, U2S. As you can see here, uh, the nuclei is uh, sort of like labeled here in blue, the you know, typical gappy stain. And then what we're seeing here in green is, and red are uh, autophagosomes and autolysosomes. And so um, uh, you'll see puncta, which we are traditionally used to seeing in an image in, in a couple slides, but this is just a, a heat map intensity representation of a confocal image. So we already mentioned that uh, top is a cellular recycling mechanism during times of nutrient stress, uh, hypoxia, uh, and this, uh, the cell of the uh, system recycles those nutrients through the lysosome and through the permeates those uh, nutrients and then used by the cell. And so the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1974 was awarded to Christian de Duh, um, and it was obviously for the discovery concerning structural and functional organization of the cell uh, which specifically uh, he identified and coined the term lysosome. He also identified and coined the term uh, autophagosome. And so here's just a depiction of, of his discovery uh, in 1955 that led him to the Nobel Prize almost 20 years later. As you're also probably familiar with, uh, just a little over two years ago, the Nobel Prize in Medicine went to Richard Shuri Osumi, and he was the Nobel Prize winner for his discoveries on the mechanisms of, of autophagy. And, and uh, he, uh, using yeast genetic screens, uh, was able to identify upwards of 20 or more essential autophagy genes that are conserved all the way through mammalian cells. And we'll talk about one of those where we made uh, collaborated with to identify a small molecule against ATG1, autophagy gene 1, which are mammalian cells. Uh, the yeast ortholog is AT1, but it's referred to as ALP1, which is a serine 3 d kinase that starts the cascade. So if you look at the timeline of autophagy from 1963, when some of these uh, first publications came out, uh, as you can see here, you've seen these before, on the y-axis is just the number of PubMed articles, and obviously on the x-axis is the year. Uh, and you can see rough, roughly around, um, certainly when my career was starting uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, the field was just starting to emerge, uh, and, and all the essential discoveries around yeast are sort of depicted there from 1963 on. Uh, and then in cancer, it's been such an emerging target in potentially cancer, uh, and so that's depicted here in the blue dots. Uh, this slide was made a couple months ago, so certainly around 6,000 articles have been published on autophagy itself, and certainly over 2,000 articles probably by now on autophagy and cancer. So if we look at the autophagy cascade, you know, from the cellular level, uh, it can be broken down into almost four or five stages, if you will, and it involves a lot of vesicular traffic and membrane dynamics. What you'll see here on the first is a C, C cup shaped organelle referred to as the phagophore. So you can see uh, plasma membrane will start to, uh, sorry, not plasma membrane, adult membrane vesicles start to expand around this phagophore growing and extending into what we refer to as an autophagosome. So this uh, autophagosome is encapsulating either constitutively uh, sort, of, sort of cytosol, basically going on in all of our cells now, uh, and uh, at a low basal level, but when induced, uh, it's massively upregulated. And it can also uh, encapsulate uh, damaged mitochondria, misfolded proteins, and also just um, some bulk cytosol. Uh, ultimately, the uh, autophagosome will fuse with the lysosome, and it's referred to as the autolysosome. And again, as we mentioned, those uh, permeases 
uh, when infused with the lysosome, the low pH environment and a degradative process in the lysosome allows those fatty acids and amino acids to be uh, recycled into the cytosol of the cell. So if you look at those four steps of uh, sort of membrane dynamics and vesicular trafficking, what's uh, very well conserved back to yeast is some of the molecular machinery. And so one of our areas of interest, our lab is interested in is this kinase triad uh, between the mammalian target of rapamycin, or mTOR, uh, AMP kinase for uh, its energy sensing role and in, uh, direct interactions with the uh, mTOR pathway. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the serine threonine kinase of one. This, this, this sort of kinase triad, uh, AMP kinase during low energy environments can activate uh, of one and the autophagy cascade that sort of nucleates this membrane and this phagophore to grow. And then similarly, there's a series of negative interactions, specifically mTORC's uh, negative interaction at the of one level, complex level is important. So when times are plenty and mTOR has plenty of nutrients, growth factors, uh, and amino acids, mTOR is high, so autophagy is low. And during times of uh, poor nutrient conditions, let's say um, mTOR is off and then autophagy is, is sort of high. Similarly, it would be true as if you treated cells with uh, mTOR inhibitors or any kinase inhibitor or signal transduction inhibitor that is upstream of mTOR. Uh, you're one of these uh, advantages of those inhibitors, they're inhibiting signal transduction pathways, ultimately getting it, say, the MAP kinase pathways or the mTOR pathway. But that uh, unattended uh, therapeutic response uh, will have an upregulation of the autophagy cascade. So we are looking at combining these small molecule inhibitors that we're going to talk about with other uh, pathway inhibitors upstream in combination. Similarly, stress responses can activate the, um, uh, the uh, autophagy pathway. Uh, certainly, um, conventional chemotherapeutics and radiation hypoxia I've already mentioned. So then the next uh, sort of molecular machinery that you can see here is sort of around the uh, initiation was there with ALT1, but then uh, ALT1 has the ability to phosphorylate this uh, uh, complex of Beckwood-1 and this uh, PX3 kinase class 3 enzyme referred to as DPS34. And then this complex uh, produces and converts phosphatol and inositol PI into PI3P. That serves as a docking site for other uh, five domain maintaining proteins, such as DFCP1 or WIPI, that recruit additional proteins that allow this membrane to grow. Uh, and then, certainly, uh, one of the genes that we'll talk about in a second is HG9, which is thought to be a Golgi uh, uh, transmembrane protein that is thought maybe to pull additional membranes as it grows, as this is a, tr a transmembrane protein, the only transmembrane protein in the autophagy cascade. So we've got these series of kinase events that happen here. Uh, if you will, uh, ALT1 is a serine 3 name kinase, DPS44 is a lipid kinase. And then we have a series of uh, conjugation events that happen in the pathway. We have the conjugation of, uh, through the work of uh, E1 and E2-like enzymes, AG7 and AG10. It will conjugate these two autophagy proteins, AG5 and 12, together. I bring this up because we're working to do virtual library screening um, and uh, small molecule discovery around AG5 and also uh, HG4, uh, which is depicted over here on the second conjugation step. So a lot of, uh, if you're familiar with the field, you'll look at measure uh, LC32 on your Western blot or the pumpta that I'll show you in a second. And so uh, sort of a cytosolic pro-LC3 molecule is cleaved by HG4 into what is referred to as you know, LC31. LC31 is then processed by these also E3-like enzymes and E2-like enzymes. Uh, and it's actually conjugated to phosphatidylalkylmolamine, and that's how it is localized to this growing auto phagosome and auto, uh, auto uh, lysosome also. And then AG4, why it's maybe an important target, is not only does it initiate uh, LC3-2 uh, uh, conversion from 1 to 2, but then also allows recycling back in from 2 to 1. So, if you think about more of a cellular context of what this would look like in a, in a membrane, um, you can see this uh, initiation or stress, if you will, complex here. ALK1 in, con in concert with uh, binding partners AG13 and PIP200 and HG101 um, make this ALK1 complex. This DPS34 lipid kinase complex is also involved. And you can see here on the nucleus and then just associate the rough ER, this, this isolation membrane is referred to as uh, nucleated by this sort of ALK1 PI3 kinase complex, and we already mentioned the phosphatidyl and acetyl 3 phosphate here being nucleated. That allows binding of this protein DFCP1, and again, you're growing frag frag of four. So uh, again, AG9 containing vesicles can come in from the Golgi, but there's also a lot of work from the recycling endosome from other labs than ours, ours 
The recycling endosome has a lot of uh, membrane source to this. Uh, the plasma membrane is a huge membrane source as it's growing autophagosome in pink here. And then less so, but also important, the mitochondria can contribute membrane uh, to, to this growing pink uh, autophagosome. So what you can appreciate here is I've mentioned the AG5 and 12 um, are important uh, conjugation steps. And then here's a starting the sequestration of uh, misfolded proteins that damage mitochondria. So as this expands, um, it eventually will certainly close and seal up into the autophagosome. And that maturation step will then fuse with the lysosome. And then again, recycling of the nutrients by those acid hydrolases and proteases that are in the lysosome. So this is our area of interest of our, our laboratory. Um, we have some genomics efforts around the pediatric kinase mTOR pathway and a rare pediatric syndrome referred to as tuberous sclerosis. Uh, we're very interested in the autophagy pathway and how that intersects with uh, dysregulated metabolism and cancer. And what's interesting about this pathway is the uh, large number of feedback loops that is just sit in this kinase triad. So if you will, if we depict this uh, image here in the triangle, as the three kinases that we study in our lab, mTOR being a serine three name kinase that controls cell growth and cell size, ALK1 that controls the autophagy cascade, and then certainly the energy sensing uh, kinase, AMP kinase. As you see, and what we're trying to do uh, in, in one of our grants is to understand this sort of complex negative feedback loops that are going on. So autophagy and cancer. Autophagy is very important in, in a lot of diseases. Uh, it's thought to be also be very important in neurodegeneration. So defective autophagy allows, say, in Parkinson's disease, the uh, PARP1 loci gene alpha so you can to, uh, accumulate. <coughs> autophagy is defective. Uh, similarly, intercellular protein tau and Alzheimer's disease could be accumulated uh, due to defective autophagy. But conversely, if you can activate <coughs> autophagy in, say, those neurodegenerative diseases, you might be able to have a therapeutic advantage to clear those intercellular inclusions from those proteins. But our lab's mostly interested in uh, the role of autophagy in cancer. Um, autophagy is induced uh, in both advanced and metastatic diseases from a number of uh, published studies. It provides a survival advantage uh, during metabolic stress, uh, both from the microenvironment. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about oncogene stress, radiation, and also through therapeutics. We feel that it's important in drug resistance, so we feel that this could be an important uh, either repurposing play if you're interested in hydroxychloroquine, which is an antimalarial drug that has been used to inhibit the lysosome and affect the pH of the lysosome, or can we target some of those kinases and conjugation events in the cascade? We feel that you can add this uh, small molecules on top of an existing regimen, maybe uh, under, under better understand and sensitize drugs to the original therapy. And then uh, we've already mentioned this, but with regards to nutrient recycling and its involvement in cancer metabolism. And we mentioned about combination treatment paradigms that are the good inhibitors that are safe would be effective for combination uh, treatment paradigms. And then finally, uh, context dependent. One of the biggest challenges in the field is to understand both the uh, genetic and environmental context that would allow applying autophagy inhibitor, and we're going to explore that a little bit more uh, in our lab. Uh, there's some, been some nice, even reporting some, some clinical trials with hydroxychloroquine uh, in combination with, say, KRAS driven. Uh, cancers or BRAF driven cancers. Uh, there's some um, important clinical trial reporting out right now with really good results in melanoma. Uh, why implying uh, hydroxychloroquine to bemrafenib um, in uh, BRAF V600 mutant uh, melanoma. So many other work has been going on in lung cancer uh, and pancreatic cancer in a KRAS mutation context. And one of the areas that we're interested in the future is the host immune response. We, you know, in the era of immuno-oncology and the checkpoint inhibitors and even CAR T cells, what is the effect of inhibiting autophagy going to have on the immune system? And most, obviously, all the work that's been done today has been done on knockout models, and we feel that um, maybe a small molecule inhibitor would about allow us to answer questions around the T cells biology, whether uh, autophagy inhibition may affect uh, memory T cells, the expansion of T cells. Or, 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 or maybe does not have an effect uh, in the context of a drug exposure. So we're hopeful to, to extend some of our work and collaborate with others on that. So we have three areas that I wanted to discuss today and questions in the lab that we're trying to address in this field is how to understand the complexity of, of this cascade um, and how to understand the complexity of, of biology, if you will. Uh, certainly some of the single transduction pathways uh, that, that are known and, and certainly the metabolic pathways um, we, we feel that at least us as a single lab or individuals cannot understand this complexity. So we're going to take some new tricks and tools to do that. I'll talk about that in a second. 
And then uh, how do we find new and known targets? Uh, we take similar approaches that's going on in this department. We have chemical screens and RNAi screens and other screens, and so we'll tell you about that. And then how can we improve the therapeutic targeting of the cascade? Uh, we have a very talented group uh, of uh, scientists in my group. Um, Kitty Martin, depicted here on the lower uh, left of the slide, uh, is uh, led uh, the work that we're going to talk about today. She's a research assistant professor, and she did her uh, uh, in the Department of Molecular Cellular Biology, did her PhD actually at Michigan State University. And a number of other people that, uh, Steph Solano also contributed to this work, and Lizette Eco, who's a, also a grad student in the physiology department, contributed to this. And Matt Cordes, who's the second to the right uh, there, uh, did a lot of the RNA screening that I'm gonna tell you about that identified some of these targets. So when you look at um, the, the therapeutic potential of targeting different enzymes or uh, reactions in this pathway, this is a review we wrote a couple of years ago, uh, looking at the essential autophagy genes here. And it's uh, really just to sort of highlight that um, what we call high therapeutic potential would certainly just be more of a druggable, if you will, druggable enzyme, uh, such as a kinase or an E2 or E3-like enzyme that's performing those conjugation events. And if you will, maybe ones that have lower therapeutic potential would be where you truly needed more of a protein-protein interaction inhibitor that are a little more difficult to, to find. So you can see on this slide here at the top, uh, the HG1 or ALT1 serine threonine kinase is obviously, due to its uh, kinase nature, highly druggable. And also this uh, lipid kinase, we already talked about beef yesterday before, that class three PFP kinase is highly druggable. Um, and then certainly uh, other, other, other proteins that we're interested in, in the pathway, like I mentioned through virtual screening, is HG4 and HG5. And then certainly targeting the lysosome uh, has been an, an effort of ours and others to improve some of the aspects of hydroxychloroquine. And through some of another graduate student's work from Michigan State University, Megan Goodall, in the genetics department, she was able to work with other, other uh, <laughs> chemists uh, in Arizona to identify improved lysotrope inhibitors that really ended up being more on a clinical background. And those are starting to be developed by investigators at the University of Pennsylvania, not from our group, but from their group, and where they've uh, made dimeric chloroquine and dimeric quinacrine as improved uh, lysosomal inhibitors uh, for cancer. So when I set up some of the complexity, uh, this is a Barron's et al. paper in Nature of 2010 uh, showing tap tagging and uh, mass spectrometry, uh, physical interactions of the autophagy cascade. So what's nice about this pathway, it's well known, it's well conserved back in yeast. And this is also uh, tap tagging done in the same cell that we already showed you with the E2S cell. So that's very nice that we can use this publicly available uh, protein interaction data set. And you can see LC3 uh, has three different or four different isoforms. So SO3A is depicted here. Uh, almost everyone that studies autophagy, uh, their uh, gene and protein that they're studying, those puncta or bands in the Western blood are usually LC3B. And you can see we know the interactions of LC3A and B, uh, LC3C. And then there's three other uh, LC3-like proteins referred to as the GABA wraps. So there's this GABA wrap here in orange, GABA wrap like one and like two in the, in the darker reds. And so by knowing this complex interaction of this network, we're able to understand some of the results from some of our own assays. Similarly, uh, it's emerging area of trying to understand the transcriptional <laughs> regulation of autophagy. And this highlight, this is a review uh, published a couple of years ago, uh, just trying to understand it. And one of the major um, transcription factors that's important for lysosome biogenesis is referred to as TFEB. And so that's just sort of, sort of depicted here. It will drive some of these, you may not be able to appreciate it in this small type here, but say AG4 that we mentioned before, AG16, UV rags, clepsisome, or P62 may be transcriptionally regulated by this uh, uh, master uh, transcription factor of the lysosome, if you will. HIF1 alpha is known to also, in increasing epoxia, regulate some autophagy uh, genes. The FOXO family, uh, we have some work on these P53 uh, being important in regulating some autophagy uh, genes, uh, and, um, and E2F1 and NF-gap B are also thought to transcriptionally regulate it. So there's a complex number of transcription factors that also will regulate some of the gene expression of the genes that are involved in the pathway. So in our lab, we didn't know how to understand that complexity, and so we uh, formed a collaboration with Bill Havlicek at the Los Alamos National Labs, and what we wanted to do is uh, start the process of creating a virtual cancer cell, and we started on the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway leading through this pathway we just referred to. And so we did that with Los Alamos and Bill in his lab, which. Uh, Los Alamos actually has a ton of um, um, research that involves uh, human health, like 
human genome project started out of Los Alamos originally, out of the DOE, and they also have a lot of great mathematicians that, can, that have been hired over the years that are trying to apply their abilities to understand uh, biological problems. And Bill Havlicek is an expert in T cell receptor signaling and P3 kinase and mTOR now, and helping us model this pathway with his lab. So I'll walk you through the approach that we're doing. This is the basis of our NCI-funded R01. Is one of the things we have to do is we have to take more engineering principles and how we build and uh, depict these pathways. So the first thing we, we need to do is, is build the model. And so I'm gonna break this down a little bit more on the next slide. But the top of the slide, you can see the mTOR complex one sitting here and the small GTPase rep that activates mTOR. And you can see sort of the GDP to GDP hydrolysis that's going on here that activates that uh, in a GTP downstate that uh, GTP is REB that then interacts with different molecules on the mTORC pathway. mTORC uh, can phosphorylate, as we mentioned before, this ALT1 complex. And then you can see this VPH34 complex depicted here. And then the series of signaling HEG conjugation events. Here's HG9, the transmembrane uh, autophagy gene that brings membrane from the Golgi. And this series of conjugation events depicted here from LC31 to LC32. And then the VPS34 complex also sitting here. So first step in, in rule-based modeling, if you will, is you need to build the model. And this is just more of a zoomed up uh, uh, depiction of just one of the nodes in this pathway. And so here's the example of the kinase triad, AMP kinase, mTORC1, and ALT1. Uh, you can see mTORC sitting right here, and its ability to interact through its rapamycin sort of FRB binding domain. Uh, so there's an interaction in this first cascade here. And then mTOR interacts in, when it's in the TORC1 complex with this interacting protein called Raptor. And so that interaction occurs in so the second uh, black arrow here through its WD40 domain and the heat domain in mTOR. And what, what mTOR obviously is known for is it's certainly kinase activity. And so to depict it here in the blue lines are its catalysis with the open circles. And obviously the red is an inhibitory phosphorylation event that might be going on in this. So this is just a then depicting the ability for mTOR to not only phosphorylate other canonical uh, substrates that are important in translational control, but also substrates that are important in autophagy, such as the ALT1 kind. And then ALT1 can phosphorylate a series of substrates. Here in this example, showing its phosphorylation of this protein AMBER1, and also that we can phosphorylate, as shown here, Beclin1 on serine 15. And so this is, we just start to build each stage of this signal transduction pathway until we've built the, the entire pathway in, in the cell. And some of the uh, uh, area, areas that you have to do in mathematical modeling of a single transduction pathway or anything is make some, some assumptions. So this, this, this here is what we refer to as model parameters. And some of these model parameters we're certainly trying to measure uh, precisely at each stage, but also you have to make some assumptions. And so this is just an example of a uh, of model where we had to make an assumption of the volume of the cell at three times 10 to the negative 12 liters, the concentration of some of these enzymes at 10 to the fifth, maybe concentration of some of the lipids a lot higher at 10 to the 6th. And then we do our best as we can to measure the association of molecules, phosphorylation, dephosphorylation kinetics, uh, vesicle formation, and vesicle degradation. And then um, we published some of this work a few years ago and then um, revised a little bit more recently. And again, uh, always uh, adjusting those some of those what we call the parameters in each of those stages. We certainly can't measure them all. So here's an example where our lab comes in, um, and this is a live cell movie. We have a Nikon epifluorescent microscope that is encased in a, in a plexiglass case that can control its environment a little better than some of those smaller cassettes. And these are, again, those U2S cells with the nuclei, obviously, uh, here in the center of these cells. I'm going to play a little movie, and you'll see these green little puncta come up over time as we've added uh, a baclomycin A1 and the catalytic mTOR from AstraZeneca AZD8005. So by inhibiting mTOR, we can induce uh, the uh, induction of autophagy in the nucleation, and therefore the increase in green puncta. But what I forgot to mention earlier is that LC22 uh, is coated on the inside of the outside of the autophagosome and ends up being degraded in the lysosome. So what you're trying to actually measure is degraded. So we need to actually inhibit the lysosome and the ATPase uh, with baphomycin A1. So when you add baphomycin A1, now you can see the accumulation of LC32. So let me first see if we can play this movie. It's going to work good. And so you can see here, um, this movie was just done over about 70 to 100 minute uh, timeline. And uh, at time zero, 
uh, cells were treated with AZ8005 and then baflumycin A1. And so you can see in that one hour time point, these little autophagosomes uh, accumulating here. And so, so we obviously can quantify this at a single cell level, and we've done this over hundreds and hundreds of cells. But then this is just the mean sort of average puncture per cell here with some standard deviation measures on the top of that. So now we can ask questions. We had other therapeutics uh, such as pipeline molecules from pharmaceutical companies, but we can also do similar approaches and knock down different genes or out genes uh, in the human genome to see which genes we could discover that might regulate this pathway. So from this work, uh, which we published in 2013, Again, we, we measure the autophagosomes per cell here. The gray little dots are what we uh, did and identified experimentally. And what we're doing here in, to generate this mathematical model of the pathway is to fit the data to the model, if you will, almost tune your radio uh, so that the pathway simulation that you put, put out here in red from the computer or in blue is, is, is tuned, if you will, to the experimental data. And then we can come up with rates of uh, vesicle initiation and turnover of, of the autophagosomes. And so here's in a basal state. And so again, uh, autophagosomes per cell and treatment time over 70 minutes. And this is just basal autophagy that's going on here in red in the presence of baphomycin A1. And some of the movie I just showed you, autophagosomes per cell over time in 70 minutes, you can see the accumulation of autophagosomes, uh, up, upwards of 50 or more of autophagosomes induced in this time period. So um, one of the things we reported out of this publication, um, and when we found something we thought was uh, maybe intuitive, is we found the absolutely essential requirement of that HG9 uh, transmembrane out of uh, HEG gene as a rate limiting step in the pathway. And we're able to knock down different levels of HG9 and have that um, uh, report out as the level of the talking. So we uh, had the, the software actually predicted that HG9 was rate limiting and and based on uh, our data, we could, we could validate that. We also found something that was maybe uh, less, in, less intuitive is that the levels of LC32, we would have just assumed as we had more LC32, we'd have more of these green little dots that plunk in the cell. But, but in fact, the, the uh, algorithm and the simulation uh, reported back that we'd actually have larger autophagosomes. And so we were able to validate that through our approach that the vesicles are actually getting larger as we had more uh, protein content of the LC32 molecule. And what we're tr trying to validate right now through flow cytometry and other, other techniques is that the pathway may oscillate. And so that may not be unexpected given this uh, series of negative feedback loops and the positive input of AM kinase into ALT1. But here's what the software is simulating for us, and now we're trying to validate this. You could imagine if you had high levels of this mTOR inhibitor, referred to as rapamycin, you're obviously going to see the mTOR activation go down very quickly and stay roughly uh, depressed. And then, as we know, as the pathway uh, is inhibited, you inhibit mTOR, you're going to release this break on ALT1, and you're going to get autophagy activation. So we would, the software is predicting we get this uh, uh, increase in autophagy with high levels of rapamycin. Now, what's interesting here is when you start to have intermediate or suboptimal levels of rapamycin, the pathway may start to oscillate. So as you see uh, mTOR addition, you might see an increase in autophagy, then a decrease, then an increase, then an increase, then a decrease that uh, is uh, inversely proportional to mTOR level. And then when you start to add rapamycin and maybe an AM kinase agonist to this pathway, it may start to oscillate more, more aggressively. And so we're trying to validate that right now. But again, what we're excited about this is that the software is making hypotheses for us to test versus the other way around. So how do we find uh, new and known targets? This has uh, historically been through RNAi screening. Um, and here's an example of a confocal microscope image of uh, RNAi screen against all the kinases and prostatases and what we refer, refer to as um, um, the autocarta, which is all the mammalian genes known to be involved in autophagy. So here again, uh, you can see obviously that uh, this was a screen, so we have more of a larger field of view here to count all these cells and uh, at basal levels of, of autophagy, just a few puncta here that you don't appreciate until you add that baphlomycin A1. And in this example here, um, again, another example of aflomycin A1, but this is in the presence of different uh, kinase inhibitors or pathway inducers of autophagy, uh, comparing uh, sort of induced autophagy to basal autophagy in the path, path A1. <clears throat> uh, this, this, this work is unpublished right now there on some of these slides, but um, it's under review right now at cell reports, so we're, we're waiting to hear back from them. So what we did here is we took baflomycin A1 
uh, and the presence or absence of this example is with an HTM2 inhibitor uh, um, developed by Merck called MK8242, very similar to Nutlin, that stabilizes PP3 and leads to autophagy at different 24 hour kinetics. And then in each well, well by well, we uh, transfected uh, a little over 518 of the protein kinases and a few dozen of the uh, lipid kinases in, into each well. And then we asked what, what, which were the genes that regulated the most. Which was nice to see is that ALK1 was one of the top hits that came out of this. Um, and he, uh, one of the areas that I'm going to talk a little bit more about small molecule discovery, uh, where it has an internal kinase domain and other interaction domains that are important for its function. And then uh, a graduate student in the lab who's now at the University of Michigan doing his postdoc, John, he uh, looked and identified another lipid kinase, very similar to the, the BPS34 kinase, but it's a class two alpha enzyme that, that we did try to find some small molecules unsuccessfully to we published that last year. So this is what the screen results would look like. So a primary siRNA kinome screen, just number of SIs sort of ranked here on the y-axis and then the standard deviation from the mean and then we're only interested in really extreme hits in, in, our, in our screen. So here's an example of, of what MKD2, the HTM2 inhibitor, looks like in control cells. So you can see a low level of basal autophagy, and then when we add the HTM2 inhibitor with control siRNAs, we can see the accumulation of a lot of autophagosomes. And then when we uh, transfect one of these hits out here in the screen, of one, we can completely ablate the autophagy. So that was nice, and then we had some other controls, such as knocking down HG5 and 12, and they had a sort of intermediate response, uh, maybe not expected because of uh, uh, the incomplete or hypomorphic nature of a, of a knockdown versus a knockout. And what was interesting here, here's the ALK1 hit. We had a number of uh, kinases and other molecules as controls. It was interesting, P53 uh, uh, was a hit, which is encouraging. But then we also identified another serine 3 kinase that might be important in actin uh, cytoskeleton dynamics, at least published, but not known to be important in the autophagy cascade. So we're currently so from this work, we, we were very interested in working with, um, and we worked with Merck Pharmaceuticals to uh, understand uh, the therapeutic opportunities of the target pathway. And so here, what we published just last month was the report of what we refer to as ALK100 and ALK101, uh, which are kinase inhibitors against ALK1, and obviously um, would be important for inhibiting autophagy. And so I'll walk you through those slides a little bit here. So first, one of the things we did is we worked with Merck and for the last 30 years, they've obviously been dealt, trying to develop kinase inhibitors and potent kinase inhibitors. So by querying their database in reverse and finding where ALK1 was an off target, we could start with an uh, existing scaffold and then use their chemists to modify those to dial out the original on target activity and find uh, and dial in the on target now for ALK1 activity. And they had a program for Alzheimer's disease where they identified a MARC inhibitor. Um, I don't, I'm not sure the origin of that project, but that's where these uh, scaffolds originated. And also the Salk Institute uh, a number of years ago uh, published an ALK1 inhibitor that we benchmarked these, these against. So what you can see here is just through biochemical IC50 assays, we did um, uh, dose response curves, uh, every uh, uh, 10 point curves, and we're able to you know, sort of uh, identify ours as this ALK100 as about a one nanomolar inhibitor, closer to eight to 10 nanomolar for this ALK101. I'll go into the selectivity profiles in a second, but then also I uh, screened them against a very uh, similarly related HG1 ortholog in mammalian cells referred to as ALK2. And then we also identified their cellular EC50s um, where uh, benchmarking against this, we certainly have more, more potent molecules than the existing molecules. Uh, the molecule we're most interested in is ALK101 that has that eight nanomolar IC50 against its target, 30 nanomolar against another ALK target, and about 400 nanomolar cellular uh, EC50. So uh, this is what the uh, kinase assays look like themselves, normalized to 100%. You can see here in blue is uh, the first scaffold that we, uh, the first series that we looked at, ALK100, and it was very potent. Uh, ALK101, um, still very potent in that 8 nanomolar range, IC50, and that Salk Institute uh, compound, 6965, uh, uh, similarly uh, potent, but not as much as the other two molecules. So this got us excited, but we wanted to really understand. Oh, so, so then we wanted to know. Uh, on target cellular base activity. And so the way we did this is we transfected F, uh, uh, 293 cells with either ALK1, the target, its interacting uh, substrate of BAC1, uh, and its uh, interacting protein HG14. This will come why we had HG14 there in a reason, as you can see. 
HALT-1 uh, will phosphorylate Beclin on serine 15, and uh, Beclin is interacting with that lipokinase and PS34, and also AG14L that allows that sort of nucleation event to happen on the alphagosome. So F stands for full media, and S stands for uh, nutrient-starved medias. You can see here when we just have the kinase and substrate, we can see it being regulated in a sort of nutrient-deprived condition by detecting phosphorylation of serine 15 on Beclin. Um, what was important here uh, was the addition of AG14. And what, I, what you can see here is uh, when you add AG14, we can actually uh, uncouple the serum starvation. So when we were trying to do these IC50s or slaughter EC50s, uh, we didn't have to actually serum starve the cells to be able to get uh, pathway uh, activation in the absence of uh, nutrient deprivation. And so that's just depicted here as comparing this uh, full media condition to this full media condition. So this will help when we show you the next slides when we're determining the EC50s. So uh, we quantify the EC50s by Odyssey um, using in the red channel um, antibody against phosphoserine 15 of Beclin, and then in the green channel total uh, Beclin. Again, taking the same uh, paradigm that we had before, transfecting in either wild type HALT1, uh, the substrate, and then uh, using AG14 here. And what's important here is this M92A is a kinase dead HALT1, and so we can show that this phosphorylation that we're seeing here is kinase dependent. So then what we did is uh, uh, take this assay that was optimized and just simply go through a uh, dose response curve cellularly for phosphoserine 15, and then generated um, the relative EC50s of these molecules. So this is what the data would look like um, through these dose responses with the benchmark compound from the SALK, SPI 6965, ALT 100, as you can see here, uh, from uh, fully active serine 15 phosphorylation uh, to almost completely inhibited at one micromolar. And then these are slightly different view scales here, so they look very similar as you go from top to bottom. But the top dose here is 20 micromolar, and then uh, our inhibitor at one micromolar, and then here at 2.5 micromolar. Um, and that's how we were able to report the cellular EC50s. To date, there's been about five or six ALT1 inhibitors uh, developed but very few have actually, um, outside the SPI compound, have really truly looked at uh, the cellular activity of these molecules. Well, some of it's just been through structural work. So next we were interested in the uh, kinase selectivity profile. So um, SPI, uh, we screened uh, biochemically uh, the kinases against uh, all serum screening kinases and lipid kinases. It turned out to be about 350 kinases that we screened and showed that there was actually six kinases uh, of this benchmark molecule uh, that had uh, greater activity against those six kinases than the target itself. So it's certainly not the cleanest tool compound. And also had 17 additional uh, targets that inhibited close to ALT1 activity. Uh, and then our, also our compound, ALT100, uh, was more potent, but maybe had similar uh, selectivity issues that we had with the SBI compound. And uh, with, with maybe a little more uh, on-target activity with only one kinase that is very close to ALT1. And then ALT1, where, where we both did the selectivity, uh, you can see there's a few CAM kinases sitting down here in this uh, sujin, if you will, tree of polygenetic uh, kinases. Each of these little branches is a branch of a kinome, and each of these little dots, if you saw this zoomed up, is a different kinase. So here we only had four kinases that we even were concerned about, uh, but none of them approached the uh, kinase activity of the on target. Which, so we feel like this could be a really nice tool for others to understand autophagy and ask questions in their field. Just before you go on, yeah. how large of a window was that in terms of the selectivity? Uh, so for the ALT-101, yeah, yeah, so it turns out that uh, each one of these red dots that are the larger two red dots are uh, anywhere from around three to four fold uh, selectivity. So, so just a few fold? A few fold, yeah. And if you actually see these maps with other kinase inhibitors, there's very few that even look anything like this that are FDA approved. A lot of them have uh, very similar close off-target effects. And so uh, we, we need to understand those off-targets a little bit better, obviously, but we feel pretty good that um, we at least got a tool molecule now to uh, test in, in preclinical models and then maybe with your help and others uh, make them more selective or understand those off-targets better. So kind of a related question, uh, have you looked at the structural homology of those kinases to all corn? We have not. Um, if you were to look at just this phylogenetic tree of the sort of alignment of the kinase domains, this little gray line there is all one. So they, so it, it isn't too surprising 
that these CAM kinases are lighting up. Um, and so we have not yet done that step. That's a great question. If you look here, these other uh, targets and the other inhibitors, our own, and then also the Salk Institutes, they have uh, off targets and they hit uh, more than their own on target, but then also have issues with uh, the, the other branches lighting up. So um, an example would be, you know, Fazadil lights up this whole AGC rock kinase uh, window here and, and certainly has had some therapeutic advantages in Japan and other areas. So we feel like we can, this is a great starting point, but we certainly would love to optimize it more. So I'm gonna run through some of the next slides pretty quickly, but it's just basically validating that um, our inhibitor is doing what we think it's doing. And so again, here we're looking at the inhibitor and the presence of that catalytic mTOR inhibitor and showing that when we add the mTOR inhibitor, we can block mm. induced autophagy. So uh, this is a new assay that we had we developed for this, this manuscript, which we're looking at that uh, lipid sensor DFCP1, EGFP, and these puncta. Instead of seeing those mature autophagosomes, these are the nucleating autophagosomes that are happening at that rough ER. We can quantify those and then we can inhibit those. Similarly, uh, with the LC32 assay, uh, we can inhibit uh, LC32 accumulation, puncta per cell in the presence of, in this situation, we need the bathomycin A1 to prevent the turnover of LC32. So we're comparing the two black bars to, to one another. And then finally, we wanted to see if there was some uh, maybe insights that we could claim, gain from this, uh, looking at the genetic context and seeing if there's other cancer cells that we could see if we could sensitize to this. And so what we did here is, um, this is a clonogenic survival assay with obviously our inhibitor. And we, we seeded cells on day zero. We put them in full in regular tissue culture media, what we refer to as full media, or we developed an OptiStar media that has um, massively reduced anywhere from 50 to 90% less of the amino acids and nutrients that you would find in your traditional, say, RPMI or DMEM, uh, reduced levels of glutamine and reduced levels of glucose. And we tried to match them as much as to some uh, reports of what those intratrumoral levels of those of amino acids and nutrients would be. And so we were basically uh, putting them in full growth conditions or these opti-starved conditions, not completely starved. We had our inhibitor for two days, and then we replenish and do an outgrowth assay for an additional five days on day three. So treatment for two days and then outgrowth for five days. And this is what the data would look like in a series of different uh, non-small cell lung cancer lines. This H838 line has a KRAS amplification or gain as many as nine copies of KRAS in it. Um, this H727 has the G12B mutation. The A549, which many people are familiar with, has a G12S mutation. And this H2030 has a G12C mutation. In each one of these situations, you can see relative cell viability on the y-axis and, and concentration on a log scale here. Uh, and you can see in full media conditions, we can generate a, a relative uh, EC50 for viability. But when we start those conditions and, and induce autophagy, on average on four to five fold, we can shift that relative uh, viability EC50, indicating that um, the nutrient stress <coughs> in the red uh, will sensitize the cells to our inhibitor. So we're excited about taking this result and extending it to different uh, in vivo models. So one of the limitations of this study is that we have not done this in animals and mice yet. And there's some great um, uh, adenobio-free in inhalation models that sort of generate uh, G12D muta uh, mutations in the lung epithelium and induce uh, uh, cancer that way. And there's also different pancreatic models where you can induce uh, pancreatic lesions uh, through injection of uh, adenobio-free to induce G12D in the pancreas. So that's some of the things we expect to do next on this project. So uh, uh, this is a summary uh, that we obviously have identified. Um, ALK1 inhibitors here, we refer to as ALK101, uh, that uh, respond to both starvation and mTOR inhibition that um, will decrease autophagy and decrease survival and sort of sensitize cells, cells, cells to this. Um, so uh, let me see. I already mentioned here in summary that um, we feel like there's a therapeutic potential of uh, identifying some of these essential autophagy genes. We can talk about HE1 today. Maybe next time we can talk about HE4 and 5 when we're there. We started to make this computational model of autophagy just sort of dissect the pathway complexity. We feel that ALK101 is a great tool for the field to study the function of ALK101 and can work with others in this department to uh, give it more drug-like properties for further studies uh, and, and preclinical and IND enabling studies. We haven't done any in vivo PK and PKD studies but those, those are ongoing right now uh, to do those vivo studies. And uh, what, what matters and what we're trying to understand as a lab is whether you know, we have some insights here to, to oncogenic KRAS status, 
uh, what other uh, oncogene statuses or tumor suppressor statuses or metabolic or immune uh, functions uh, would affect the ability of these molecules to work. And then the last thing I wanted to just give a little shout out, um, our lab also was interested in a rare pediatric syndrome referred to as tuber sclerosis complex. Last year we reported the genomic landscape of this disease. And what's interesting about this path, uh, pathway uh, is that the mTOR pathway is uniquely evolved in this pathway. Maybe combining autophagy inhibitors would be helpful in this, in this disease. So I just want to spend two sides setting up of this disease if you haven't referred to it before. So tuber sclerosis complex is a rare pediatric syndrome. A third of the cases are inherited, two thirds are sporadic, and it's due to a two hit Newton hypothesis model at the d disease low site referred to as TSE1 and TSE2. And what these children will have are uh, a lot of neurologic and brain involvement, and certainly these are just some actual MRI scans showing that. You can see it here's where the name, get this disease gets its name, but they have this malformed cortex or tubers here depicted in the white arrowheads. They will also have these uh, little tumors on their lateral ventricles. Here we refer to those as subpendual nodules that when over time can grow in this giant cell astrocytoma in this child. And so what's interesting about this and why I just want to you know, highlight this a little bit to you is that the pathway we just talked about down here with the serine threonine kinase ALK1 and autophagy all feeds into this mTOR cascade and rapamycin sits at, at that access. Our obviously rapamycin gets its name for either mammalian or mechanistic target of rapamycin. Uh, and it, was, it has a very interesting environmental story and natural product story if you don't already know about it. But what we're interested in, and we were able to work on this project in Novartis and continue it here at Michigan State, is that loss of either TSC1 or TSC2 uncouple this sort of ability of growth factor signaling and nutrient signaling and leads to a hyperactive mTOR state. So what's been very effective for these children is the uh, Novartis' version of this called Everolimus that inhibits mTOR signaling because these kids have uncontrolled uh, mTOR signaling. and then. Uh, some of the downstream effectors that are important in cell growth and metabolism. So I just wanted to highlight that because I was in the, pharma, in the pharmacology department and the toxicology department today, but uh, rapamycin, uh, about a few thousand miles off the coast of Chile, uh, is an Easter Island. And then a 1964 Canadian expedition isolated rapamycin from the soil and, uh, and, and, uh, and it gets its name because the natives refer to Easter Island as Rapa Nui, so rapamycin in its name. What's interesting about this target is it's known, <coughs> it is known about uh, rapamycin and its ability to bind mTOR and FKB12, and that uh, chemical protein complex inhibits the pathway. And so what I wanted to highlight here is rapamycin is referred to as its generic name Strolimus, but Novartis' version, all they did is modify um, this, this sort of, if you will, north uh, R group here, uh, and, and Novartis just added um, a few uh, methoxy, or methoxy groups to that and ended up with Everolimus, Wyeth has Temsorolimus, and even Merck is trying to develop Riofluorimus. So I think this sort of encourages that uh, you can work with sort of natural products, but also um, they can be very beneficial for this rare pediatric syndrome. <coughs> so with that, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my lab, everything I presented today came from most of these people on the lab with Katie Martin leading those efforts in my group. Uh, Nicole Doppel is our grants manager. Uh, Stephanie Solano did a lot of the beautiful Western blots and and uh, immunohistochemistry, sorry, the immunofluorescence that you saw here. Uh, Jess uh, worked on this project also. She's headed to medical school in the, in the, in the fall. Uh, Abby Slater is a faculty member uh, out east. Uh, and Lizette, I mentioned, is a graduate student working on this project. And Matt did that beautiful confocal RNA ice cream that I already mentioned. And some of our funding sources uh, um, for most of the work that I talked to today was sponsored um, by Merck and the National Cancer Institute. With that, thank you. That you had some cell viability studies. Mm -hmm. Have you done proliferation or migration assays with your compound? Not, not, not at the level that you're probably looking for right now. I mean, it's a really interesting question. Um, we have not done any uh, migration assays. Some of other aspects of the lab we've done <laughs> migration assays have, but not much. Um, and, and with regard to proliferation, um, we we have not done a lot of proliferation assays. I mean, certainly um, we've controlled for some of the assays that we did for viability there. We've controlled for proliferation, so we used other chemotherapeutics that would certainly block proliferation like an axane. So, do you so we can control for that in that isogenic experiment, but we, 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 we feel that, um, that they would not have a major effect on, on my, uh, proliferation, and we don't know about migration. Thank you.
I do know with the demurafinib studies, yes. if the rapamac, I'm not sure what they're what autophagy drug they're combining. It's femurafinib, yeah, with the V6 RNA and melanoma, yes. Is it um, been able to prolong how well those patients can tolerate? Because they get resistant to that drug pretty quickly. Yeah, no, I think the, 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 the clinical trials that are going on right now are still too early, and they're just looking at uh, re, um, overall response rates, either partial response or complete response, and, and the patient numbers are still relatively small because they're phase one trial. And so we're talking about 20 or 30 patients being treated, and they're not using, say, just all one inhibitor, certainly, but they're using uh, hydroxychloroquine, and they're getting, um, from what I see, you know, really nice uh, partial and complete responses in the, in compared to bemorephinib by itself. So it's encouraging to do the phase two trials, which is absolutely fine. And safety is, 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 is not um, not an issue as much because uh, hydroxychloroquine is an antimalarial drug that people can use for, for that malaria. And so uh, there hasn't been any unwanted toxicities by adding those two together. So we are seeing now a uh, sort of pun intended proliferation of catalog of mutations in different cancers. Yeah. And what I'm wondering is, have you taken the genes in some of the models that you are building and asking for these individual genes? Then how frequently are they estimated to be mutated in different cancers? And so what I'm getting to is in terms of the relevancy, if you will, of your idealized model, which I think is very important to build, and in terms of how that may really function or not function with different cancers. Yes, yeah, so that's, so that's a great question. And um, so if you look at these genes, uh, because they're conserved certainly back to yeast, and then you look at um, either gene expression or mutational profiles across hundreds and tens of thousands of cancer samples, they're very lowly mutated and they're relatively uh, equal in expression levels to their sort of housekeeping nature of the genes. Um, we, uh, as you saw with building the model and other aspects, is we feel that key sing signal transduction and, and energy sensing and nutrient sensing pathways all impinge on it. And so that, uh, it, it'll be upregulated due to its environment, either oncogenic or, or the extracellular environment, and less so that it's actually mutated in those cancers. And so there is a very a low, as, uh, there's nothing statistically significant that drops, jumps out of these HG14 mutated genes. But we feel that it's still a relevant target. You know, tubulin's not mutated very often in, in human cancer, and certainly the taxing were affected there. So your 101 molecule um, combined with stress, you use nutritional stress. Did you try radiation or any we have not, other we're, kinds? We're of not. We just, we just uh, were rushing to get this work out, and, um, we have questions around hypoxia, and certainly there's great different hypoxia experiments you could do in chambers. Um, we haven't done radiation yet either. But that's where we think um, we want to get the tool out for other people to ask some of those questions, but also, you know, we would, we would like to try it ourselves too. But it's a great question. We don't know about, I mean, it would be great if you know, certainly a mainstay of a lot of, say, lung cancers and other cancers mm -hmm. is certainly radiation. We have no understanding if this molecule even crosses the blood-brain barrier if we want to use it in other GBM situations and things like that. So there's a lot to still know about what we're doing here, but um, get it out to, the, to others to be able to test that in their labs too. Good question. Thank you. So on the RNA screen, do you know how much stable they are in animals or how much bioavailability is the close RNA molecule? Yeah, so we, our lab, and, and where, I got, where I cut my teeth early on was we, we were fortunate to be the first lab that, that, publi that published uh, the full kinome and phosphatome RNAi screen in combination with conventional chemotherapeutics. So we, we were fortunate that's how our lab got our start. So we still really are very favorable of using RNAi. Where we did that is that we use siRNAs in cells that are highly transmittable. And so we're not using a long-term vi you know, viral infections. We're not doing a dropout or a pools, of, a pools of viral siRNAs. We're just using the synthetic siRNAs, transfected well by well by single genes, and looking for a phenotype in this cell line that is highly transmittable. So that cell line that is actually depicted here on the screen still is a U2S cell line, and uh, it doesn't come across well sometimes, but we use that line as, as, our, as our model organism, if you will, a um, mammalian model organism. So it's our yeast, if you will, 
but in the mammalian world. And then we can ask these sort of loss of organic function questions or chemical biology questions. We then take those findings and then bring them out to, as you saw here at the end, a different cancer or even say Parkinson's disease context. When we find something, we then move it into a, a collaborate with experts that are then become these experts. Other people have tried to use these siRNAs across panels of disease relevant lines, and we just have resisted that. And that's where I think siRNAs and RNA I guess a lot of the bad rep reputation is that people are transfecting them across lines that have variable uptake, variable knockdown, variable expression, and they end up with variable data. And so we just keep ours in our single system and, um, and then extend from that system. Your question was, um, there has been some work over the years of using uh, siRNAs as a therapeutic modality by either complexing them uh, in, a, in a lipid formulation or certainly putting them in a viral construct. And um, most of those have, have, have limited utility due to targeting. So one of the biggest problems with gene therapy and certainly any sort of uh, gene-based approach, either knockdown or gain of function, has been the fact of efficacy of targeting. And so uh, we, we don't use these uh, siRNAs in vivo, just for, for target identification in, in, in vitro. Uh -huh. Last question. <laughs> Okay, so your your initial triangle with all the negative feedbacks, sure. that's very predictive of oscillations, mm -hmm. which you then show uh, under treatment conditions, I believe. Now, in the wild type, you would expect some sort of oscillation potentially of different frequency than the one you were showing. And then, obviously, with your model, you might be able to show how to pull that out of the stable frequency phase space out into something that explodes, you know, yeah. uh, non oscillatory. Um, so I was wondering if there's any prediction about the wild type sort of micro oscillations that might exist. Um, really, really great question, and we're fascinated with just some of that, um, you know, kinase and, and cell biology. And so Yen Schmidt, who's a new faculty member, uh, that can do more of that single cell imaging around H chert and in DNA damage. Uh, a new faculty member just across the street, and I keep really he and I are collaborating now to sort of ask some of those questions more at the single molecule stage. We're certainly, our ability in our lab is not at that level of resolution. And I think it's going to require that level of resolution to sort of answer the question yeah. that you're getting at. And so that's why we're excited about that, that collaboration. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.